Hey, did you know that Gary Gygax, the co-creator of Dungeons & Dragons, once gave Dungeon Masters everything they need to know in this little three-page essay with a, with a really goofy title, How to Set Up Your Dungeons & Dragons Campaign and Be Stuck Refereeing It Seven Days Per Week Until the Wee Hours of the Morning! Exclamation point. And that's in all caps, by the way. That almost sounds like a modern D&D YouTube video title. <laughs> And I actually made a video already about Gygax's advice for world building from this essay because I found it very helpful. Spoiler alert, he says, don't make an entire world. Make a small region to play in with a few important locations, but the most important location of all is, of course, the dungeon. So we're gonna go over Gary's best advice for great dungeons because I'm Bob. This is where we learn how to have more fun playing RPGs together. And on the subject of building a dungeon, the first thing that Gygax tells us is, this is very difficult and time consuming. Oh, but hold up. This essay was from 1975, before there was a single dungeon published anywhere for people to even get a frame of reference. And heck, people were still using typewriters to transcribe essays. So think about that for a second. Every detail of a dungeon, drawn and written by hand, every monster intentionally selected from your little D&D pamphlet, or just as often created with inspiration from your favorite pulp fantasy novel or comic book. Yeah, building a dungeon must have been terribly tedious. But you know what? That dedication is why the dungeon's creator was called the Dungeon Master. It was a title to be earned not just by studying that little arcane pamphlet of rules, but by painstakingly designing levels of a game for your friends, probably your neighbors and classmates, to have fun exploring and probably die inside of. But in that strange way, creating a dungeon was a labor of love. So sure, today I can instantly generate a random dungeon fully populated with traps and monsters, or use ChatGPT to spit out details, but if there's no soul behind that creation, who cares? I think the most important first step that Gary didn't lay out in this essay, because he didn't need to, it was the default at the time in 1975, is that your dungeon must be intentional. It's an art form, and yes, use online tools, use random tables, and absolutely use the books on your shelf to mine ideas. Because even by doing that, merely choosing which elements to accept or reject, you are already applying your own creativity, and it will show when you run this dungeon. Side note, if you're looking for one resource to build better dungeons, I simply must recommend my own book, Delve, How to Build and Survive Deadly Dungeons, launching on Kickstarter soon. It'll be a collection of expert dungeon design theory, a bunch of dungeon crawls, traps, and new guidelines for keeping them fun, dozens of new monsters, and new player options for D&D 5e and for Shadow Dark RPG. I'm writing it with my partners at Eventier Games who have already published several great 5e books and getting some help from friends of the channel like Dungeon Dad, Professor DM, Pointy Hat, and many more. I'll be revealing more info in the coming weeks before we launch on Kickstarter, but I'll tell you now, people who back it in the first 100 hours will get some extra goodies. So be sure to use the link below to sign up for that notification when the Kickstarter goes live. Soon. All right, Gygax's next tip. Each level should have a central theme and some distinguishing feature. This is fantastic advice. The examples he gives, See for yourself. I.e., a level with large open areas swarming with goblins. One where the basic pattern of corridors seems to repeat endlessly. One inhabited by nothing but fire-dwelling or fire-using monsters, etc. So would each of those themes or features make a cool dungeon on its own? Totally. Do they belong in the same dungeon? Maybe, but only separated by individual levels? I don't think so, Gary. Again, this is something that has changed with time. There's no reason you can't make a dungeon where every level is completely unique, but you end up creating the nonsensical monster condominium where your players will rightfully question how and why all these disparate creatures are living in such close proximity. So twisting that advice a little, 
Your whole dungeon needs a central theme and a distinguishing feature. Then, each level can be variations on that theme, like you can have a wide variety of creatures on different levels, but they're mostly undead versions of those creatures. Or, you have all goblinoids, but some are undead, some are fiery, some are oozy. But even then, I still think it depends on the scale of the dungeon and its levels. The best way I've found to measure this is by the number of rooms the players are expected to explore. Because after 50 plus rooms in the fire dungeon, your players will probably want a change of scenery. But if you only have five rooms of fire next to five rooms of undead next to five rooms of ooze, that's when the dungeon will feel kind of ridiculous. So a great rule of thumb that we'll expand on in an upcoming video and in Delve, How to Build and Survive Deadly Dungeons, is to make a dungeon that only has five to 10 rooms with one theme, or potentially two themes blended together. But another benchmark that I like is a maximum of 30 rooms per theme, because with more than that, I find players start hoping for that change of scenery. And as a game master, I don't really want to prep more than 30 rooms for one game session, even if I'm using a module. Then, with those numbers for rooms in mind, you can decide if or how to split those rooms across multiple levels, which is related to Gary's next tip. As each level is finished, the various means of getting to lower levels must be keyed and noted on the appropriate lower levels, so that if a room sinks four levels, it will then be necessary to immediately show it on four sheets of graph paper, numbered so as to indicate successively lower levels. Yeah, that was one sentence, and I didn't get it on the first read either, but he's just saying, be sure your maps for each level are interconnected. Whether that means one really tall room extending vertically through multiple levels, or if you have stairways, ramps, tunnels, subtly sloping corridors, or literal chutes and ladders, it must be clear to you, the dungeon master, how this dungeon pieces together. Now something Gary implies here is that it should be a bit of a puzzle for the players to figure out. Wait, did we just go down one level or two? Because mapping the dungeon purely based on the DM's descriptions was part of the game at this time. One or more players would literally be asking for the dimensions of every corridor and sketching out the floor plan because dungeons were mazes, labyrinths that the party would have to find their way out of kind of like a mini game. And the extra fun part of this mapping process was that it could reveal gaps between rooms, indicating the presence of secret doors and hidden areas. And I did not play D&D in the 1970s, but for some reason, this is how my first group played D&D, and I was the one mapping out the dungeon. So please let me know in the comments if your group ever used a cartographer and what decade of D&D that was. But like Gary himself told us earlier, this is very difficult and time consuming. So most people stopped playing that way and my group doesn't do it anymore either. It's common really for the GM to share an accurate map of the dungeon as the party uncovers it, or even to abstract the dungeon. So no one needs a map. Whatever your method, Gary's main advice here holds up. Having multiple connections across different levels or even the same level is crucial because it gives the players options. Those fire goblins almost killed us when we came down the stairs, but maybe they won't see us if we take the rear tunnel and come at them from the side. And just like the number of themes in your dungeon, the number of interconnected passages must be balanced appropriately. Of course, if each room is linked in just one linear chain, there are no options. Bad. But if every room is an interconnected grid, you really only have one weird room. I think that for every five to 10 rooms, you should have one to two dungeon entrances or level connections and two to three intersection rooms, rooms that provide access to two other rooms instead of just to one. Again, this is not a science, it's an art. And we'll cover this construction in more detail in my video about five room dungeons and in my book, because for the purposes of this video, Gary didn't give us any advice on that. In fact, Gary kind of jumps back one step saying, a careful plan of what monsters and treasures will be found on each level is most necessary. In other words, plan what monsters and treasures are in each room and maybe make a wandering monster table. But again, no specifics on how to do that in this essay. He just continues, and it can take just as long to prepare as the level itself, for you may wish to include something unusual, a treasure, monster, and or trick or trap 
not shown in D&D on each level. And this is more solid advice, especially if your players are experienced and familiar with the common dungeon denizens. It might just reignite their beginner mindset to describe a monster that they haven't heard of or seen before. That could be whether it's completely original, it's a reflavored bear, or it's from a new awesome book about dungeons. Then perhaps as anecdotal advice, Gary spends the bulk of this essay just summarizing the 13 levels of his original old Greyhawk castle. The first level was a simple maze of rooms and corridors, for none of the participants had ever played such a game before. The second level had two unusual items, a Nixie pool and a fountain of snakes. The third featured a torture chamber and many small cells and prison rooms. The fourth was a level of crypts and undead, the fifth was centered around a strange font of black fire and gargoyles. The sixth was a repeating maze with dozens of wild hogs, three dice, in inconvenient spots, naturally backed up by appropriate numbers of werebores. The seventh was centered around a circular labyrinth and a street of masses of ogres. The eighth through tenth levels were caves and caverns featuring trolls, giant insects, and a transporter nexus with an evil wizard with a number of tough associates guarding it. The eleventh level was home of the most powerful wizard in the castle. He had Balrogs as servants. Before the Tolkien estate put the kibosh on that. And my favorite line in this essay, level twelve was filled with dragons. And finally, the bottom level, number thirteen, contained an inescapable slide which took the players clear through to China from whence they had to return via Outdoor Adventure, which was a totally separate board game that they used for exploring the above-ground game world. So if you'd like to see Gygax's advice for building that above-ground world, check out the video on your screen and remember to sign up through the link below to be notified when the Delve Kickstarter goes live. Thank you, and thanks to the Bob World Builder patrons for directly supporting what I do, and keep building.